We are so happy you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. If this message touches you in any way, let us know about it. You can email pray at jesusistherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. If you would like to know how our ministries are touching the lives of others, you can go to jesusistherock.org. While you're there, consider fueling our passion to reach the lost and the unsaved by giving to us. You can click on the donate button at the top right hand corner of the screen of our website. Again, thank you for joining us and welcome to Church on the Rock. The title of the message this morning is Fixing Our Focus. Fixing our focus, because that's one of the things that's broken in many of us, is our focus. If we were to look back to chapter 6, Jesus would give us some context for this that he's saying in chapter 7. There were no chapters in the original manuscript. We sort of put those there, but these two thoughts really go together. In fact, I'm going to read just a little bit to you, beginning with verse 25. Jesus said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food, more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. If God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate your thoughts, the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Or as I like to say, don't borrow trouble. We have enough trouble to deal with right now. Let's not worry about what might happen if somebody should come and this should happen and all the stars align just right and what would happen. What happens if if I get laid off? What happens if the kids get sick? What happens if, and we spend our time borrowing trouble, looking at what could happen or may happen or you know what's what's down the road somewhere? I like, he says, look at the birds. Look at the flower. Stop talking for a minute. Stop talking and look. Stop complaining. Stop griping and look. Start focusing on. You know, stop focusing on what you don't have and start focusing on what you do have. Look at the lilies. Look at the, look at the birds. Stop focusing on what you don't have and start focusing on who he is. Everybody say, fix your focus. Fix your focus. You're focusing on the wrong things. You're so busy focusing on the splinters in everybody else's eyes, you can't see the log in your own eye. In verse 25, Jesus says, that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. And then he ends in verse 34 saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Stop worrying. Don't worry. Before Spuds McKenzie, Jesus was the original. Don't worry, be happy. Some of you don't know who Spuds McKenzie is, do you? I asked my stepdaughter last night, I said, you know who Spuds McKenzie? She said, who? So I'm dating myself anyway. We won't go into who Spuds is. but He said, don't worry, be happy. But Jesus was saying it a long time before. Stop worrying about stuff. Stop worrying about other people. We spend most of our time not worrying about us, worrying about other people. We're upset with other people. We're looking at other people. Instead, fix your focus. If you want to look at something, he said, look at the birds. Look at the lilies. They're not worrying. They're not stressing. Look at what God has blessed you with instead of what somebody else has. I saw a quote the other day. It said, don't let what's on your plate get cold while you're looking at what's on somebody else's plate. 
Stop looking at what somebody else has or doesn't have. Fix your focus. I don't have time to fix what's broken in everybody else's life. I want to fix what's broken in me. Because I want to tell you, when you think about it, that's, that's really all I can fix. I can't fix what's broken in you. I may be able to help you fix some things, but I, I can't fix what's broken. To be honest, most of the time, you can't fix it either. Only God can fi- Only God can bless a mess. Only God can really fix what's broken in us. But, but you see, this is where we get off track because we start trying to fix our circumstances. We start trying to fix our relationships and fix our finances and, and, and fix this problem and fix that. And nothing wrong with that. that that's, that's not a bad thing in and of itself. But the first thing we need to do is fix our focus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Fix your focus first. Because see, the problem is I can't always fix my circumstances. I can't always fix my finances. I can't always fix my relationships. I sure can't fix my past. Sometimes I can't fix my future. But the one thing I can do is I can fix my focus. I can fix what I'm staring at. I can fix what I'm looking at. I can fix what I'm thinking about. I can fix what I'm worrying about. That's our focus. I can fix that. The old folks used to say, look for the good in everybody. Right? There's a little bit of good in everybody. I don't know about you, but my mama used to say, if you don't have something good to say, then if some folks live by that rule, they'd never talk. Right? Because all they want to do is run somebody down and talk about what somebody else is and, and, and what's wrong with other people. Uh, somebody told me one time, I said, Pastor, you can find something good to say about the devil. I said, well, you have to admire his persistence. Right? Fix your focus. There's so many things that are beyond our control. So many things we can't control. We can't control the weather. We can gripe about it, but we can't control it. We can't control how somebody else acts, what somebody else says or doesn't say, what somebody else does or doesn't do. The one thing we can control, the one thing we can fix, if we will commit ourselves to it, we can fix our focus. We can determine what we're going to focus on. Now, why is that so important? Why is this so important to us to learn to fix our focus? Many relationships fail not because of a loss of love, but because of a loss of focus. Friendships fail not because of a loss of friendship, but because of a loss of focus. Churches fail because of a loss of focus. When we stop caring about what God cares about, we forfeit the right to call ourselves the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. When churches start focusing on everything except what God has called us to focus on, businesses fail because of a loss of focus. Nations fail because of a loss of focus. And ironically, our focus is the one thing we have control over. We can't always control everything that happens in the church, but what we can control it, and we must control is our focus. We have to always keep the main thing the main thing. Remember in the book of Revelations where Jesus talked talk to the Laodicean church and he says, you've done good, you've done good, you've done good. However, I have this one thing against you. You lost your first love. Things got out of focus. Not that you don't love me. You just somewhere along the way lost your first love. You got things out of order. You got things out of focus. How many relationships have been destroyed because we lost our focus? See, our problem's not falling in love. Our problem, we're we're having a problem staying in love. Right? It's our focus. A little boy runs in the house one day and tells his mama, guess what, mama? I've fallen in love. Well, right there, he just told you he's fallen. You know there's a problem, right? Because that's what we do. We fall in love and we fall out of love and we fall in. We're hot today and cold tomorrow. Uh, Somebody said there's a reason fairy tales always end in marriage because no one wants to see what happens next, right? 
The falling part's easy. It's the staying part we have problems with because we lose our focus. So let's talk about a couple of areas of our focus. Let's get kind of practical with this. Let me ask you this question. Is your focus on finding or becoming? What's your focus on? Is your focus on finding or becoming? True and lasting happiness is not in finding the right person. Finding the right person. True and lasting happiness is in becoming the right person and being the right person. In fact, think about this. If you happen to find the right person and you're not the right person, think how bad you're going to screw up that right person. You're going to do nothing but mess up that life. You're going to destroy that right person and destroy your relationship because you've never focused on becoming the right person yourself. I can't tell you how many good people have been destroyed because they went into a relationship hoping to fix the other person. They're going to fix this person. They're going to rescue this person. And you try to talk to them about what's going on in this situation. And they say, I know, I know, but, but, but he'll change once we get married. And I say, you're right. He'll go from bad to worse. The only way you're ever going to have the right people in your life is to first become the right person in your heart. We need to focus more on becoming the right person and being the right person rather than finding the right person. No, no more looking for love in all the wrong places and looking for love in too many faces, searching their eyes, looking for traces of what I'm dreaming of, hoping to find a friend and a lover. I bless the day I discover another heart looking for love. And that's how I call it the national anthem of life without Christ. We're just looking for love. I'm looking in your eyes, looking for a trace of what I'm dreaming of. Hoping to find a friend and a lover. I bless the day I discover another heart. I'm just looking for love. I'm looking for somebody. Looking for somebody else that's looking for somebody. We go out looking and searching and struggling to find that right person who we think will make us happy. We think they will complete us. Well, I'm sorry, Renee Zellweger, but Jerry Maguire can never complete you. Some of you don't know what that's talking about, but... It's a cute and romantic line from a movie, but it's a lie Satan in Hollywood has sold you. Nobody else can complete you. Only God can complete you. And as long as you think somebody else can complete you, you're never going to find a healthy relationship. We've got all this wrong. Society teaches us today that your life really doesn't begin until you get completed with somebody else. you got to get in a relationship to be made whole somehow. You know, your life doesn't begin till you get married. And, and that's when your life begins and, and you're somehow incomplete until you find someone. If that's true, tell me, how do you worship Jesus? How can you worship Jesus? We worship a guy who stayed single right up until the time they killed him. How can you worship Jesus? If the apostle Paul had waited until he got married to do something for God, we wouldn't have half the New Testament. How do we think that somehow somebody else will complete us? Stop looking for somebody to complete you and start focusing on becoming the complete person God created you to be. When God created mankind, it doesn't say he took two halves and made one whole. It says, and the two of them became one flesh. The two of them, the two of them. Two halves don't make a whole. Two halves make a mess. Your broken, incomplete life plus my broken, incomplete life makes a literal hell on earth for both of us. People say, well, marriage is a 50-50 relationship. No, it's not. If it is, you're looking for somebody else to complete 50% of who you are. Marriage is when one person is 100% complete in Christ and another person's 100% complete in Christ and the two of them come together and are made one flesh. Stop looking for somebody to give you 50% of your self-worth, of your value. We end up sucking the life out of each other. 
We need to get to a place we're not looking for somebody to, to complete us. We don't complete each other. We just complement each other. But I'm complete in Christ. Are you focused on finding the right person or becoming the right person? Some people are like the little dog that's always chasing the car. You know, always going after the car and barking and after And I think if you ever catch it, what are you going to do with it? Besides stand there and bark at it. And I look at people today who spend their entire lives chasing the right person. They're chasing the right person. You, you, you're going and, 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 and you're chasing and chasing. And one day, lo and behold, you catch it. And then you spend the rest of your life barking at it. Right? You spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what to do with it. Or more than likely, how to get rid of it. Now that you've caught it. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Stop focusing on finding. Start focusing on becoming. Number two is your focus on what you've got or what's not. Where's your focus? Seriously. Is your focus on what you've got or what's not? I want to talk about the two most important tools in fixing our focus. We're going to get into our tool bag. The first tool we have in a relationship is the ability to magnify whatever we choose to magnify. Anybody remember these? Used to set paper on fire outside with them. Get the sunlight. Preached a whole sermon on that one time. And you know what was on? Focus. You have the sun that's up there. It doesn't just burst stuff into flames all of a sudden. But if you take that sun and you focus it into one particular little area, that little paper will start getting black. Black and pretty soon, poof, it'll burst into fire. Same sun, same power. Now you've just taken that power and focused it on one point. We have the power to magnify whatever we choose to magnify. We, we can do that. When we first get in a relationship, we tend to magnify all of the amazing things about that other person. We'll tell all of our friends how wonderful they are. You just got to meet this guy, I'm telling you. He's just awesome, and we're just, boy, we're just, we got him right in the old magnifying glass. This, this person, you just got, he just, he's got the best sense of humor. He makes me laugh all the time. See, that's dating talk. Marriage talk is he's just obnoxious. Always thinks he's funny. Never takes anything serious. That's marriage talk. Dating talk is, she's so bubbly. She's got the most outgoing personality. She's just a people person. Marriage talk is, she never shuts up. All she wants to do is talk, talk, talk all the time. Isn't it amazing what we can magnify? Dating talk is, you're going to love this guy. He's just so laid back. I mean, this guy is just, he's easy going. That's dating talk. Laid back is code word for lazy after marriage. He was laid back when you were dating. Now he's just lazy. He's laid back, all right, more like laid off, laid up, laying around. But we've got the power to magnify both the good and the bad in people. See, this works both ways. Now, real quickly, and I've shared this with you so many times, I almost didn't share it with you again, but it's so important. Ladies, you have no idea what you can get out of your man just by magnifying what's already in him. You have no idea. You're complaining about what's not instead of magnifying what you've got. Come home from the grocery store. I learned this a long time ago. Ever since they changed from paper bags to plastic bags. 
Several years ago, when I was little, you had paper bags. About the best you could do was two bags. Maybe three if you really crammed it. Now they got plastic bags. And you go in and, and you know, you go in to buy a $2 something and you come out $90 later. And you still got, you know, you got about six bags. But, but you get these bags now and, and, you know, you pick up all these. And they got these little handles and these plastic bags. You just keep putting them on, putting them on. You, know, you walk in with a whole grocery store just in your arms. And men, you, you take them in. Your wife will look at you and say, how do you do that? You got all the groceries. What? Is there anything left in the cart? No, I got it. I got it. You're so strong. And you go back out and start looking for something else. You come in, you got bags in your teeth, and you got bags. Hey, look at it. It's easy for me. I got it. Ladies, if you would just magnify what's in your man. Whatever you magnify. Listen to this. Whatever you magnify, you get more of. Oh, you didn't get that. You ought to write that down and write it in stone. Whatever you magnify, you get more of. Let me give you one more that I've given you over and over and over again. And ladies, I hate to bust you out on this. I hate to do this to you, but I have to do it. I have to enlighten some men in here. When your wife tells you, and it's not you, she tells her friends in front of you, my man is the best cook. Nobody can flip burgers like that man can. I mean, he comes in, he puts stuff on the grill, and man, it'll just, you never have to cook again. I mean, he'll go get him a little chef hat and an apron. He'll be out there. He believes what you said. You're not that good, trust me. It's just flipping burgers, all right? But whatever you magnify, you get more of. For better or for worse. For better or for worse, stop magnifying what's not and start magnifying what you've got. In fact, if you're going to magnify the negative, at least do it in the dating relationship. Don't wait till the marriage relationship. I mean, these things can come in handy in a dating relationship. That's when you ought to be magnifying. See, see, you're talking about, you're just looking and saying, oh, he just loves God. He's just, uh, yeah, yeah, but does he have a job? <laughs> right? You ought to be looking at everything in the dating relationship. I, I know how wonderful he is and he's all there, but, but, but you know, let's look at everything. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble here. <laughs> Let me move on. To magnify something makes it larger. If you're always magnifying the problems and the sins and the struggles in somebody's life, they're just going to get larger and larger and larger and larger. And they'll, they'll soon begin to appear larger than they are. Let me tell you something. You're always telling your spouse or somebody how lazy they are and how no good they are and how sorry they are. You're telling your children how no good and they're sorry. They're just going to get no gooder and no gooder and no gooder. <laughs> they're just going to keep getting sorrier and sorrier and sorrier because whatever you magnify becomes larger. It becomes larger. They start to believe what you say. When we begin to magnify the good in others, even if it's just a speck of good, that man burns everything he tries to cook. You still magnify it. You start focusing on the good, and soon you'll start seeing more good and more good and more good. Or as Brother Tick says, they get gooder and gooder and gooder. It just keeps getting gooder and gooder. How many would like your spouse to get gooder and gooder and gooder? Start magnifying the good in him. Start magnifying what you've got instead of what's not. You have the power to fix your focus. Stop focusing on, on, on what, what you don't have, what's not, and start focusing on what you have. The scriptures tell us to set our minds on things above, not on things below. Listen, if you come into this church and, and you, you, come in, you come in looking uh, to see what's wrong in this church, looking to find what you don't like about this, let me save you some time. You're going to find it. The Bible says, seek and you shall find. This church or any church, when you go in looking for problems, you'll find them. 
But when you come in looking for Jesus, saying, I don't care what music they're playing. I don't care what the lights look like. I don't care what I'm sitting on. I don't care what color the walls are. I'm here looking for Jesus. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Ask and you shall receive. Whatever you seek, you're going to find. You're going to find. What are you focusing on? What are you looking for? Okay, real quickly, the other most important tool in our tool bag, the most important tool in fixing our focus is not this. This is important, but the most important is probably this. Sometimes we have to put down this and pick up this, right? Stop looking for the right person. Stop looking for the right church, looking for the right mate. Focus on becoming the right person. When I can look in the mirror and know that I'm created by God and loved by God, but I can see whatever's in me that needs to be fixed and changed. I mean, do I really need to say any more about this? Verse five, let me just give you this. Verse 5 says, hypocrite, get rid of the log in your own eye so you can see clearly to help your brother get rid of the speck that's in his eye. All of this really comes down to one question. Am I going to focus on them or me? That's what this is really all about. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you can help somebody else with a splinter in their eye. So let me throw this out real quickly and then I'm done. We talk a lot around here about the scripture that says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, love others the way I've loved you. Love others. Love love your neighbor as yourself. But somebody needs to know this morning, you will never be able to properly love your neighbor until you first love yourself. And that's a huge problem we have today. That's why people can't love other people. Because in their heart, they don't love themselves. They, they see this and we condemn ourselves. We look at ourselves and we see we've got logs in our eyes. We know that and, and we, you, you'll never be able to properly love your neighbor until you first love yourself. You'll never be able to have a proper view of others until you get the proper view of yourself. You're incapable of having a healthy relationship right now because you're still looking for somebody else to complete you. You're still seeing yourself as incomplete, less than, not worthy of. And you will destroy every relationship you enter into unless you first learn to love yourself and realize that I'm only made complete in Christ Jesus by Christ Jesus. Love others as you love yourself. Only you can fix your focus. But your focus is the one thing you can fix. There's so many things you can't fix. But you can fix your focus. You can fix what you're looking at, how you're looking at it, what you magnify in your life, what you magnify in other people's life. Are you magnifying what you've got or are you magnifying what's not? Are you interested in finding? Are you interested in becoming? And so I want you this week to just meditate on these two questions. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. I pray that this message touched you in a way that only God can get the glory from. If you would like more information on our church and our ministries, you can go to JesusTheRock.org. While you're there, consider giving us a financial donation by clicking on the Donate button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us, and have a very blessed day.